for those of you actors that are abroad and keep hitting me up to find out how you can study in the States, well, this episode is just for you. I spoke to Mexican actress Regina Careja, who has a master class to help actors from out of the country figure out how they can get their paperwork and everything that they need in order to apply for a visa. She has so much great information. I love talking to her, and I know you are going to enjoy this conversation as well. Let's go to it now. So what I want to know, Regina, is what made you decide you wanted to start a program to help people who were trying to get their visas to come to the United States? Well, first, it was going through the process. You know, I, I, I graduated from the Stadler Studio of Acting in 2020, and the pandemic hit. So while I, I always knew that I wanted to work in the U.S. as an actor. So going through the process, it was just very blurry and it was a lack of accessibility to the information that made me go, why is this not everywhere? You know, why, why is it so hard to get this type of information? Why is it so expensive? Why is there a guide? Is there a map? So going through the process myself, I, I'm very organized and I, I like to have a step one, step two, step three thing, you know, everything that I do. So I created this kind of step-by-step -step process of the O-1 visa. And then after I got it granted and I got it approved, I had a few people coming to me being like, how did you do it? Like friends around me and, and uh, students from underclass uh, cl classes below me at Adler, they were like, how did you do it? And, and I was like, well, I kind of put up together a map for myself uh, and yeah, I can share it with you. And I started receiving messages from people from all over the world, uh, India, Australia, uh, Norway, uh, Japan, you know, people who were studying in the U.S., and wanted to extend their stay and, and you know, work uh, in the U.S. in their industry. So it started like that, you know, going through the process myself and making a little bit of a guide map for others because it's really hard to leave your own country. It's like it's hard on its own, and then it's another challenge to be in the acting industry. So you know, putting those together, it's just building a sense of community between international students and as international artists and international humans and helping each other out. So what made you decide you wanted to come to the States to study, first of all? Well, I, I grew up in Mexico and in Cancun. So, you know, very Caribbean. Uh, we got a lot of tourists. And I always knew that I wanted to be an actress. Um, my, my uncle is an actor in Mexico and he would always tell my parents like this girl needs to be put on stage. She's hilarious. She's got so much energy and she's a great dancer. You know, I was this three year old jumping around and I always knew I wanted to be an actress. And when I graduated high school, I was like, where are the best acting schools in my opinion? And my dad is always pushing my sisters and I to do the best that we can and to find out how we can make it doable. So there's a lot of no's everywhere, but we have to find out how we can get a yes. So he printed out a list of different colleges in the U.S. And he was like, Juilliard and NYU and UCLA and, you know, Yale. And I was like, ah, no, I, I, that's impossible. And he was like, nothing is impossible. Just then you already have the no. Go and knock on the door and wait for a yes. So, you know, I auditioned for everything. And he was like, where are the, wh what is it that you want to do? I was like, well, I want to be on Broadway. I want to be an actress, a theater actress. And maybe sometime, maybe someday I'll, I'll do film and TV. But my core was screaming theater. And he was like, well, then go to New York. And I was like, no, what? I can't do that. And, but I've always had that mindset of 
find out how you can do it. So that's how it was. I knew that the best acting schools were in, in, in the US. Um, I knew that unfortunately, what we see in the media in Mexico is very underrepresenting of the, the population, you know? Uh, in telenovelas and in the, the industry's changing, but back then, I'm talking about nine years ago, um, where all the, the main characters in the telenovelas and in the, the TV programs were representing what we call white sicans, which is Mexicans that pass as white. <laughs> And they're mostly, you know, Argentinians or Chilean or from different places with lighter skin and didn't really represent the Mexican population. And as a brown and curvy, loud Mexican, I had this, you know, chip under my shoulder that was telling me that maybe the industry wasn't ready for me in Mexico. And I knew that there were more opportunities in the U.S. to celebrate my Mexicanness and my Latinaness, and I I knew that that was going to be a great a great place for me to thrive and learn about my culture and to succeed in this industry. And how did you get to Stella Adler? Because I studied with Stella. What? I That's studied it? with the <laughs> Stella Adler herself. Wow. Yes. Yes. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. I love, just a parenthesis, I just love how life works. And then we all, you know, are Adler alumni. And to have the privilege to talk about that you worked with her is incredible. I love how life surprises us. We're wearing pink and we went to Adler. Latina power. Exactly, mamacita. <laughs> of course. Of course, mamacita. Um, that's wonderful. So I went, the first time I moved out of my home, I was 18 and I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I lived there for two years and I went to a college that doesn't exist uh, now, unfortunately, but it was called the Santa Fe University of Art and Design. And I studied there for two years and unfortunately the school shut down. So we had to seek our education elsewhere. Um, and when that happened, my goal was always go to New York. And when we, when I was going through, you know, the admission process and SATs and have the IELTS or the TOEFL exam to prove that I speak English and all of those things, you know, the Mexican education system is really different from the U.S. education system. So it was a little bit hard for me to do that crossover and apply for exams to prove blah, 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 blah. So the goal originally was to move to New York. I took a detour to New Mexico for two years where I call it being my training from a small town to a different small town, but in another country. And it was preparing me life was preparing me for me to move to New York and now understanding that I'm in a different country, but now not from a small town, but go into, you know, the concrete jungle where dreams are made of. So it was very helpful. So when the school shut down, this was May, 2017, the school shuts down and they tell us in April. So, you know, it was, it was really chaotic. So all the schools are, you know, I'm applying to different schools and everyone's telling me, yeah, you're welcome to, you're accepted, but you would be starting off next year, not the school year, but the next, the following year, or you can start in January or sorry, our aud auditions have passed. So it was really, really stressful. I ended up being on the waiting list at NYU and I, I, I didn't want to compromise my visa. You know, I had an F1 visa back then as a student. And I didn't really want to compromise that, you know, tentative if I was going to go or not. So I went in through the NYU aff affiliation schools that they have. And I saw Adler and I saw Strasburg and I saw Meisner and I saw the film uh, and TV school and the musical theater uh, school and the voiceover. So I went in through the program of the schools that they had, that they were working at in partnership. And I saw the Adler studio and I was like, 
this is it. Even if I'm not studying at NYU, I can still go through this program. And it's a three-year three -year program, and this is growth as a human being and as an actor are synonymous. And that was exactly what clicked in me. That was like, this is my school. So it was, it was a great journey. And that's how I ended up in New York and at the Celeste Adler studio. I was the only Latina in my class. I believe it. I yeah. believe it. Yeah. yeah. Cause that's, I was the only Latina <laughs> in, in uh, Stella's class. Um, and this was in LA cause she would wow. come to Los Angeles in the summertime. Right. So I studied with her for four summers wow. and, um, when okay. the class would start, just a little side note, mm -hmm. and when the class would start, we probably would have a hundred actors in the class. Like the first day, it was wow. packed. Well, right. 99 seats, because it was a 99 seater theater. Yeah. And <laughs> by the third week, we were down to 50. Wow. By the fifth week we were down to 25. I mean, it would just get smaller and smaller. So by the end, there was hardly anybody in the class because people would get so intimidated by her because she was, yeah. she was a force to be reckoned with. I, I always kid, you know, the first thing she would say when she would start the class, every, every time she started class, you know, you, you're a new student, you come in, she says, you know, don't look at me admiring me. I'm just like you No, you know, I'm here to teach you, but I'm no better than you. And then it started to change. Like the, her, her story would, she would start out like, we're all here. Everything is great. And halfway through, she would go, do you know who I am? I am the great Stella Adler. And so the first two summers, she did it halfway through, but I was waiting. I would sit there going, is it going to be today? Is she going to go off on everybody today? And then, <laughs> then the last two years, she, she let us know immediately. I am the great Stella Adler, yes. but it was, she was, she was phenomenal. She was phenomenal. So the, the great thing about, uh, Stella, uh, I, I think every, uh, technique has its uh has its positives mm -hmm. what i loved about stella um was that she really in, enforced that you had to do your homework mm -hmm. you needed to know the background you needed to know the history like if you were doing a a, a piece uh, one of the classics that took place in the 40s you better know what was happening in the 40s you better know what the history of the 40s was, the politics, the dress, the the mannerisms. You needed to know everything. She Correct. and and she taught only the classics. She taught. Uh, um, uh, oh God, I'm I'm losing uh, a streetcar named Desire. A streetcar. Thank you very much. I was trying to get it out of a streetcar named uh, all of Tennessee Williams. She was very mm -hmm. big on Tennessee Williams yeah. and a couple of the other uh, uh, classic um, writers oh of son. that period. Yeah. And so she taught that and she also stressed the importance of doing your homework. If you were playing a nurse, you better go to the hospital and, and shadow a nurse, ask oh, questions, wow. find out what they do, get as much information as you can uh, so that you could be prepared when you went on set. Whether you used it or not, it didn't matter. It needed to be in your body. And I love that. And, and to this day, I use that. The third thing that she taught was the respect for theater. Mm. So oh, if yes. you came to the class and you sat like this, like you, she says, we are not at the beach. Correct. We are in the theater. <laughs> you sit Correct. in the yeah. theater. With the you know, respect so she, that it deserves. Yeah, so she did not play, and I, I so appreciated everything that she taught. Uh, my thing was I always wanted to, because she would tell us how she was staying at uh, Marlon Brando's house. That was her. Right. That was her. That was her baby. 
So she would come in, she says, I was with Marlon today and we had lunch and we went to blah, 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 blah. And (laughs) then, uh, so I always wanted to yell, Stella! Right. That was was always my, and and she would, she would reprimand you. I got reprimanded reprimanded a couple of times and I was like, yes, Miss Adler. Yes, Miss Adler. I was like, okay, yes, yes. You know, but, um, cause she didn't like young ingenues. Yeah. She, she zeroed in on you and she was, uh, but I was like, okay, yes. Yeah. You are right. You are right. (laughs) What she also wanted, um, she also wanted chorus participation. So if Mm. she said something, you repeated, yes, Miss Adler. So one Mm. time she said something and I went, yes, Miss Adler. And she says, I did not say you could speak. I was like, okay, (laughs) but it was fine. I, I, you know, I didn't have a problem with that. I was like, okay, I was just so happy to be in the class with her. I was very, very cognizant of the fact that history was in front of me. Mm. So, and, and just, you know, the, the discipline, the um, commitment, she required that if you were going to be a student in her class, you needed to show up uh, on time. You know, you needed to be there. You needed to stay throughout the whole thing. And, and it was a little, uh, it was a little trying for, uh, people in Hollywood because they're used to being the stars. Right. There was only one star in that classroom and it was Miss Stella Adler, nobody else. And we had people who were, there were leads on series and they, you know, they not in that class, they were just an actor who was there to learn. So anyway, I just wanted to share a little Stella since you, since you um, were in there. I love the fact that you do your homework Mm -hmm. that, you know, because somebody else who might've ventured to New Mexico to get their, their feet wet (laughs) would, that would have had the same experience of the school shutting down would have ran back home. Right. And I love that you just said, no, we're going, we're going to New York. So you were able to get into uh, Stella Adler pretty quick after yes. that, once you discovered who the, who the schools were available to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was immediately as soon as that I ended my time in Santa Fe in May. And in September, I was already in New York, starting a new chapter in my life. Beautiful. And so how did, so let's go to the visa because you are, you are in New York, you have a visa. Now, did you have one more year on it? Was that it? You had already done two years in New Mexico? Right. So as an international artist, when you go and move to the U.S., you go in with an F1 visa, which is the student visa. And that student visa usually lasts four years, which is kind of like what a college degree takes. However, every time you exit the country, you get um, a different document called I-20. And the I-20 must be signed by your administration, you know, someone in administration, whether it is the international advisor or someone in a charge in school that signs that said you're still enrolled in that school. So because I already had my I-20 for four years, my visa for four years, and I only did two back in New Mexico and I was starting a new um, school in a different state, then my visa was prolonged, even though it said that I was still enrolled at the Santa Fe University of Art and Design you know, it passes on to the Stella Adler studio. And once that F1 expired, because I was still studying, I had to have a new visa issued and a new I-20. So it was long. It was, I took five years of being a student. And then once I graduated, the, it depends on the program. Sometimes and government... Stella was two years. Was Stella three. a two year? Oh, Stella was a three year. Okay. And yes. Stella, just for uh, just for you who is watching, Stella has a program for international students 
So they they already have that component in place. Correct. Just, just want to say that because there are some schools and I have a list. If you are interested, you can uh, uh, leave a comment and give me your email and I will send you that list if you're interested in and coming to Hollywood, because I do have the Hollywood list of Ooh. schools that receive uh, foreign students and and help you with your um, with your entrance because they they take foreign students and they are top notch. So I yes. I sorted through the, the I love mishmash that. and I got a <laughs> list of it. So when I saw your uh, not to cut you off, but when I saw mm. your Facebook uh, notice that mm -hmm. you were teaching this. I was like, that's who I need to speak to because I was, <laughs> I, I have been seeking someone to talk mm -hmm. to about the visas for a while. Cause I get a lot of, of actors all over the world mm -hmm. that will ask me, you know, I want to come and study. And I was like, I don't know anything about it. And about the sixth time I got, uh, I, I got a student or, or someone who was interested in coming to Los Angeles. I said, okay, I gotta, I gotta do my homework. So I have a, I have a list, people. I, have a I list. love that. Go ahead. You got the Hollywood yes. one, and I got the New York yes. one. So there messages. Yeah. Yes. yes, definitely. So at Adler, it was a three-year program. I was in the day conservatory. They also offer an evening conservatory, which is only two years, um, and they do have different programs. But the one that I uh, got was the three-year conservatory, which is eight in the morning to 6.30 p.m. every day, Monday to Friday. Um, and once I graduated, each school, when they get it, when they accept international students, the government offers a year, whether it is three months, six months, or a year. It depends on how long the course that you took in a university or in the school in the U.S. Um, lasts. Because I spent three years in this college, I got a whole year for the OPT. The OPT is a year in which the government offers your optional practical training, which is what it stands for. As a student, as an international student on an F1 visa, you're not allowed to work in the US because you are a student. However, when you graduate, this optional practical training year, six months or three months, depending on the length of the course it is for you to put into practice everything that you learned and now you you get the opportunity to work in your area of study so as an actress i could work um as a you know entertainer i could work as an actress i could work as a director i could work as a you know uh stage manager i could work in uh uh, you know, party entertainer, uh, theater uh, teacher, um, you know, with all the gaps that in involve my training. And once that year was over, that was the time where I had the option of either going back home, going to a different place, or submit for the O1 visa. And I decided to spend my OPT year to build credit for the O1. Because unfortunately, the USCIS, which is the office of, of immigration that sees this cases, um, they don't take anything related to either training or education. Um, because this O1 visa, and maybe I, I might be getting ahead of myself, but the O1 visa is granted to, it is called the Extraordinary Ability in the Arts or science or education or but it is an extraordinary ability extraordinary talent so you must prove that you are extraordinary in your area of field so nothing that is related to study or training counts in the portfolio so i took my opt year to build professional stuff and add it to my portfolio so i could prove to the uscis that i was exceptional um, which was really hard because I did it all during the pandemic. So wow. theaters were shut down, nobody was working. So I had to create my own opportunities. I was just going to ask you. So with the OPT, you can, uh, do your own short, you can do your own film. 
Correct. Is that is that part of showing what you do? So Correct. you so if you say, you know what? I'm going to write a script for myself of a Latina in in New York from uh, 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 Cancun, and I'm the fish out of water, and I'm going to blah blah blah, and mm-hmm. now I'm going to do a 20 minute film. I am now I have a piece of content that I can show. I am after I finish that because I have a year. I'm going to do a web series or I'm going to have a YouTube channel and, right. and do my characters uh, uh, on my YouTube channels, show you how I can transform into different characters. Correct. I'm going to write a blog about acting and my acting uh, um, adventures in New York, yeah. meeting a casting director, meeting a director, uh, auditioning for a play, what it was like to study with uh, a, a, a prominent, uh, at a prominent acting school, uh, what I learned on my way to Broadway. Correct. So I could do all those things and that would be considered part of the OPT. Uh, right. uh, requirement that they would they would say okay all right now we know you are because I, I think that's important so it's you went from an f a f1 visa mm-hmm. which is for students mm-hmm. from other countries coming into the united states correct your visa was pretty much completed because you finished the program and now you are applying for the o1 visa which is for extraordinary individuals in the arts or in the sciences. Right. Art, yes. science, okay. business, there education, go. you know, name okay. all of that. Okay. Adultism. Okay. Okay. So continue. So you had this year mm-hmm. that you were doing your portfolio in the middle of pandemic. Which was extremely hard. You know, I was extremely lost because we were still in lockdown and you know, with my father's mentality of find out how you can make it doable. How is it doable? How can you do it? How finding how, you know, uh, they say that the person who created the light bulb is that yes, uh, Edison, Edison, Thomas yeah. Edison, right? So mm-hmm. they said he has something written somewhere that says that. He didn't it wasn't fail. that he failed a hundred times. It Correct. was that it took him a hundred times to figure out how to do the light bulb. Exactly. And there's a similar story to Walt Disney. Walt Disney was trying to get uh, uh, the 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 Disney um, uh, amusement park, and he got about thirty no's. Right. He could not get the financing. But he kept going, he kept going because he believed in what he was doing. Correct. And it's important that you believe in it because everyone yes. has a dream. Everyone has an idea, yes. but it's those that activate the dream. Mm. And part of the activation means you do not give up. You just keep going because somebody, somebody has the yes you need. Exactly. And those that have the no are just leading you to the, to the yes right person. Way. Correct. Go ahead. I'm with you, girl. I Go ahead. Go that. ahead. We, yes. You're from my <laughs> tribe. Go ahead. <laughs> exactly. And that mentality, uh, you know, every success story has its troubles. We don't we, we we don't hear people that we admire saying that they got it right on the first try. That doesn't exist because that's a human that's the human experience, failing. But that's the scam that people buy into. Right. It's a scam. It is. And people buy into it. Oh, I just happened upon it. It just happened. No. I was walking down the street and it just happened. No. And nobody happen. tells you about all the hard work because they want it to appear like it just happened. Correct. I don't know how it happened. No, it just happened. And I, I'm a true believer that. There's no such thing as luck. I believe that luck is a mix in between being prepared and being at the right time in the right place. But you have to be prepared. You have to know. You have to train constantly. And it's not only applied into acting. It is applied in everything that we do in life, how we approach things. 
So I didn't get stopped by the pandemic. You know, I was like, I need to have, I mean, if I'm getting, if I'm applying for the O-1 visa, if I want to extend my possibility of working and be a working captor in the industry in the U.S., and I have my motive, and whether my motive is, you know, uh, being famous or making money or whatever your motive is, in my personal experience, my motive is to tell stories that authenticate the genuine lives of Latinos, of Mexican people, and break the stereotype that is told by the media and has been told by the media for years. Um, that's well, can I can I stop you for one second? Correct. Please. Your motive is not to be rich and famous. No. Your motive is to contribute. Correct. The byproduct of contribution, the byproduct of telling stories of Latinos, putting it out there, mm -hmm. uh, 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 putting your blood, sweat, and tears into your projects, the byproduct of that is you get people start talking about you. You oh, get notoriety. And 100%. then, God willing, you get the fame. But right. I think uh, I think some people, I just, I just wanted to jump in because this is a pet peeve of mine that, you know, I always say, well, I want to be rich and famous. Well, no. then you're not going to be rich and famous. No, as an that's actor. not, no, and that's because, not what I meant. That's not what I meant. Okay. All right. No. I just wanted to clear that up. Yeah. Go ahead. No, Go ahead. that's not what uh -huh. I meant. I meant, no, I, no, I was saying that it, that's somebody else's motive. That's valid for them. I'm not saying that that's my motive. No, my motive for me, is to contribute into telling genuine stories of Latinos. Now, the byproduct, it'll come by itself, by the work that I do. But if somebody else really wants to be famous and that's their motive, it's completely valid as long as that motive keeps you moving. As long as that motive. I don't judge. Everyone has a different motive. You know, We don't know the, the reality of different people. We don't know if they were struggling all their life with money and something that really fuels them to be active and follow what they do is to get money. We don't know, but we can't judge anybody else's motive. As long as that motive serves you to be activated and seek that. So in my personal experience, my motive in that moment was to get the O-1 visa. That was my first thought. So, with that, of course, comes different things, which is getting to work in the U.S., getting, you know, the permission to work and, and getting the, the, the opportunity to work with people that I've always dreamed to be working with. And, you know, yabada yeah, badu. But in that, <laughs> back then, <laughs> it was to get the O-1 visa. So I broke it down into steps. First step is I need the O-1. Then my second step is to work and, and expand my, my curriculum. Next next stop, we'll see. But I go one goal at a time. And the way that it worked for me was that I promised myself that I was going to work in at least one or two projects each month to make that portfolio. So if, and I was auditioning and auditioning, and there were so many festivals online during the lockdown. I submitted to every single one. I submitted, you know, they were doing so many Zoom productions and doing a lot of things. I started writing, you know, my training wasn't acting, but I started, you know, branching out into my abilities. I directed, I produced, I wrote, you know, I started doing spoken word, uh, poetry. I realized that I had a, this gift of writing, you know, that it's not the gift. It was for me. I realized that I liked the, the things that I wrote, that I, Regina, liked what I wrote and how I expressed it. And so it gave me confidence into seeking, you know, the path to, to the visa. So during that year, I worked, um, I, I wrote plays, I submitted them to films. I, I, I wrote this one that's called Carta a Toda Mujer, which is... Uh, kind of like a spoken word uh, video with images that I took myself and about being Mexican. And is this the video you have on YouTube? Yes. Okay. I saw it. Okay. Yes. I, I just wanted to check. All yes. Right. I do have that one. 
I, I have a few, um, but that one was the first one that really resonated with people. And it was really impactful for me to see what my words, because I was not acting, you know? I mean, we're always acting. But when it comes to delivering something that was really personal, one thing is to perform somebody else's words, but to express yourself in your own words based on your personal experience and connect and see the reaction of the audience and see the reaction of people who may feel in a certain way similar and resonate with your words. That was extremely powerful for me. And that was extremely like eye breaking, groundbreaking for, for my personal walls that I had when it came to, if I don't, if I'm not on Broadway or if I'm not doing this TV show or a network show, if I'm not in LA, if I'm not in New York, it broke completely my mindset of how I could make it work. And so I started writing and I started, you know, involving myself, connecting to, through social media helped a lot. You know, it's, it's a double edged sword, social media, in my opinion. Um, but it's a great way to network. And this is what I tell my clients. Network is extremely important. It's as important as talent and training. Training, talent, and network are the three bases for having a successful acting career, in my opinion. But but you have to know the business. You correct. have to you 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 can't just uh be an actor, you have to be the CEO of your business. Correct. You are the CEO. And that's what you did. You became the CEO of your business and say, okay, I'm going to, I want to be here. So what do I need to do to yeah. stay here? Instead of waiting for someone to give you an opportunity, answers. you said, I've got to create opportunities because that's the only way I'll be able to stay here. Exactly. I, um, I have a, a, a book uh, it's a, it's a planner and it's also, it's in digital and soon it'll be in, um, a website so you can do it on, on, you know, on mm -hmm. the web, but it's called acting smarter now. Mm. And in it, I break, you have a calendar section, you have a section for meeting your representation. So if you have a, an agent or a manager, you write all your stuff down. If you are going to industry meetings, if you're going to meet with a director, a writer, a, a PA, whoever you're going to meet, you write it down. You put down your auditions. You put down your callbacks. So I've set it up to kind of give you a whole, um, everything you need in a book. I love that. You know, it's in a book. I, I write in my book. I, I started doing this. Uh, about 30 years ago. Wow. Um, Cause I've been acting almost 50 years professionally. I've been doing it 45 years wow. and all the information that I took early on from casting directors and uh, people in the industry was you need to be organized. Mm. That was the thing that I learned. Um, I started in the record business. So I learned how to be organized because I was working in the record business. Mm. And then I learned everything that I learned here I get to apply in acting. Correct. And one of the things that I saw in the record business with the musicians and the singers were that they were too busy being artists. Mm -hmm. They were, they had no business savvy and they got taken advantage of. And so even though they may have made millions of dollars, they were destitute because the managers took their money, the labels took their money. Right. They did not have anything to show for it. And uh, uh, one of the most amazing things happened to me because um, I came to Los Angeles. I didn't go to another country, but I came to another city. I came to Los Angeles at 18 to pursue acting. Mm -hmm. And I got a job working at a record company called Casablanca. Okay. Well, Casablanca was the company it had. Donna Summer, wow. Kiss. Um, there were all these great um, dance um, artists. Mm -hmm. and not that Kiss was a dance artist, <laughs> a, a, a group, but we had we had um, uh, uh, the Village People, wow. and we had Parliament. We had all these people. But right. what I learned, I learned from Gene Simmons of Kiss. 
he would come to the company when he was not on tour every every friday that he was not on the road he would come with his accountant he would come with his briefcase and in a suit and tie and he would go through the books to make sure he was getting all the money that was due him yeah. i didn't see any other artists ever do that and i i had to deal with artists all the time and all they wanted was the limousine they wanted to be put up in the best hotel and i would say look you are paying for this the company is not paying for this you are paying for it so just think of it this way you are already in the red every time you ask me to get you a limousine you are more in the red so even if you have a platinum album you will never see a penny from it because they've been charging you and they've been charging you with interest so you're not going to see it. So whenever I had to take artists out, we took, I either took them in my car or we rented a little cheap car. And, and, and if we had to eat, I took them to Fat Burger. I took them to, uh, uh, you know, a, a little uh, fast food place. Cause I was like, no, they're going to charge you. And I, and I only learned of that because the first artist that I yeah. took shopping for clothes for a, a photo session for their album. We went to this place. It was very expensive. <laughs> My boss had given me his black card yeah. and his Amex. And, and we got in there and they, they gave us cappuccinos and they had mimosas <laughs> and they were like, Oh, and they brought these things. Well, I got two t-shirts and two blazers and they got jeans. It cost about $4,500. And I went back to, and that's what they wanted. You know, they were like, oh yeah, we want to, this look. And so I went back and I, I, I'm 19 years old at that time. I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my job. This right. I, I told my boss, I said, I, I went to the store you said to go in and, and they charged us $4,500. He said, don't worry, they're gonna pay for it. And that was a big lesson for me. Mm. I was like, oh, that's how it works. So I sell that to say, I've learned so much as an actor, so much in the business, and I put it all in this book. Mm. So I have an audition tracker. I have, you do your weekly business. Right. I have, um, one of the things that I have that I truly love are my target sheets. Oh, I love that. that so you write down your top target contacts wow. of people you want to meet mm -hmm. you know so that you should be you you talked about this earlier and I, I i just wanted to talk about it the top tv shows or what are the top you want to do broadway so what are the broadway producers right. that you would like to work exactly. with who are the broadway directors you want to work with exactly. then you want to uh, uh talk about um shows that your competitors have done. Exactly. So I actually have a list so you can write down, oh, you know, my friend Susie, she she and I go up for a lot of the same parts, even though we're a little different, mm -hmm. we, we are always going up for the same parts. So instead of me looking at it like uh, she's my enemy, I'm looking right. at it like, oh, what she got, they may like me. So let me write down, she worked on X, Y, Z show. Mm -hmm. The casting director was so-and-so. I'm going to send them my picture and resume. Exactly. I'm going to follow them on social media. I'm going to start getting, uh, I'm, I'm going to start to get to know them through social media. I'm not going to bombard. Hey, you gave, you gave Susie a job. Give me a job. Exactly. And you know, cause there's a way to network, right? Yeah. So, uh, so this book is all about uh handling your business as an actor and right. then i have goals i have a section for your goals i have a section for affirmations because as actors we have to constantly affirm yeah. ourselves our mindset is crucial as actors if we're always thinking negative we can't go anywhere that's true we it, think of it like your your mind is your vehicle mm. and if your vehicle always breaks down you're not going anywhere but if you have a vehicle that is always operating smoothly, you can go anywhere in the world you want. Exactly. That vehicle will take you anywhere. And so you got to keep your mind clear. You got to keep it fresh. You got to feed it good things. You got to, 
you got to speak well to yourself. Yeah. It sounds like your family uplifted you growing oh, up. 100%. Unfortunately, 100%. a lot of actors, a lot of actors don't have that. They don't have somebody speaking well to them. Yeah. So it is important that you do it to yourself. So I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to uh, share that. Uh, that little bit of of uh, stuff because as actors we are in charge of our our business. So you you are in New York. Um, you're not in New York at the moment, but you are in New York. Yes. So tell me how your process is going for you as an actor from abroad in New York. I love New York. I think. Every person that lives and thrives in New York are, you know, underdogs in their own country or in their own towns. You know, everyone who has the adrenaline, the patience, and the drive to live and love New York stays in New York. You know, because we all got a little freak everywhere. You know, we all we are a little freak. So I love New York <laughs> in that sense because you 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 must have that patience to you know, go out in the street and it's, everything is just so normal in New York that we, that when tourists come or when people from other way, uh, from other places come, they're like, how can you live in New York? You know, they, there's, there's a culture shock. And I always knew that I was a little, you know, loud and, and, and excited and joyful and, you know, optimistic, and, and I have a lot of drive. So when I moved to New York, I was like, this is my city. This is where I need to be. I always felt like growing up in a very small town, I always felt like I didn't fit, like I was too big. In size and in thoughts and in, in emotions, just I was just too big. And when I moved to New York, I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not, this is where I fit, you know? So New York for me has extremely changed my life. I love New York. So let me ask you a question as a Latina in New York. Yes. Have you connected with a lot of the Latino theaters? Cause there are, there are theaters yes. in New York that are bilingual. They do English and Spanish. Yes. And since you are a Spanish speaker first, and an English speaker that that gives you an upper hand because there's a lot of Latinos that don't speak Spanish that would not qualify for a role in those theaters right because they don't speak even though they're they're Latino uh culturally mm -hmm. they're not Latino where you know where they can speak the language right for whatever reason for you know yeah so Oh, I love it. Um, there is a play that I, uh, I well, we did it in February. It was produced by Boundless Theater Company and the Perspective Theater Company. It was a combined production of a wonderful play written by an extraordinary playwright, Amalia Oliva Rojas. She is phenomenal. And the play is titled How to Melt Ice. And it's a word game because ICE goes in reference of Immigration Customs Enforcement. So it's a play about three tias, three sisters that move into the U.S. with the son of one of the aunts and the daughter of the other aunt. And they move to New York and they try to give and offer the best uh, that they can for the children. So it's the juxtaposition of, you know, crossing the border, but also growing up from like the perspective of three adults and two children who could apply for DACA. And this is a play, they work at a cantina, they have a cantina, they have a restaurant. So it, it talks about social political issues when it comes to immigration and being a Mexican immigrant in the US. It talks, uh, it, it's a commentary on the political decisions and actions committed to, you know, uh, when it involves immigration. So for me, it was incredible, incredible to be able to tell the story. We were nominated for the Ola Awards uh, for Best Production. We were the only off-Broadway off, off Broadway 
show nominated because the rest of them are off Broadway. Uh, we were the only off off Broadway show nominated, and our writer was nominated, our director was nominated, and a fellow actor in the show was nominated. And then we were also nominated for the Lata Awards, which is the Latin Alternative Theater Awards, and, which I had the pleasure of receiving the Best Actress in Drama Award for that play. Thank you. <laughs> and it was incredible going back to the theaters you know, the Spanish-speaking or bilingual theaters in New York, the Lata Awards in the event and the ceremony, I got to meet so many people that are international and that are bilingual, especially Spanish-speaking, because it's a Latino alternative theater awards. So, you know, there's El Repertorio Español, El Teatro Sea, eh, La Tea, there's, you know, Theater Works is a, is a company that does like educational shows for children. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was um, part of the production of El Otro Oz, which they just opened in LA, or they opened a few months ago. They're doing the, the tour on the, on the West Side. I and will have to look for it. Yes, it's titled El Otro Oz. And it's a okay. uh, Latinx version of The Wizard of Oz. So, you know, uh, Dorothy is this quinceañera girl. Her name is Dora. And it's a celebration of Latino. So in my, in my journey as a Mexican actress in the United States, I've had the honor and pleasure of working in shows that celebrate the Latino-ness. And especially for me, my Mexican-ness. Um, I've been on tour all over the country twice, no, four times, two, two shows, but in two different years. So four tours in total. I'm going on tour again in September with a show titled Sugar Skull, A Day of the Dead Musical Adventure, which we also are going to LA and we've been going to LA for the past two years. So it's a Day of the Dead show with folkloric dancing and and it's a Mexican celebration of Day of the Dead. So I've been honored to be able to, you know, share my culture with people who don't have access to this information. You know, someone in Wyoming or in Idaho who don't really get the access to 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 connect with different cultures. It's an honor for me to go to these places that they don't have the accessibility and have discussions with them and, and, and have a commentary and a Q and A about not only teaching, but exploring their different cultures, because it's not only for them, but for us as actors that we go into this tours into places that I've never been like, Oh, I really want to go to, uh, I don't know, somewhere in the U S that is a very small town. It's mainly the you know big cities. So for me also, it's a it's a it's joy to explore different subcultures in the U.S. You talked about Ola. So mm -hmm. for people who may be watching that are Latino that are back east, Ola is a great organization for actors to participate in. And if you're on the West Coast, Nosotros is a great uh, right. organization to participate in. Or Nalip. Yeah, which, exactly. I love I love all three. Yeah. Um, but I am and well, I, I'm a I'm a Nosotros card carrying member, but yes. I am a Nalip alumni. I am a, a Nalip an alumni. Love, love, love. Um, I haven't participated in the last couple of years, but the first 15 years I was all in it, on it, that. around it and through it. I was uh I'm a, a screenwriter fellow. Um, with the Nalib. And I say to every actor out there, connect with an organization that you can attend workshops, you can um, go and hear and go to events, because that is where you start networking. Correct. So either Nalib, it could be film independent, it could be a theater uh, organization in New York or in Chicago or Miami but get involved in organizations where you can uh, start to create community or get involved in community. You know, um, as whatever 
um, culture you come from, if you are Latino, if you are black, if you are Asian, there are not a lot of us. And we do have the upper hand as quiet as it's kept. I know everybody's always giving the negative about what they don't have for you, how you can, mm. but as quiet as it's kept, there's only a little community of us. Yeah. And, and so what you want is to get into those communities, grow in those communities, get your name, uh, uh, get a reputation for being a, an actor of excellence. Yeah. That will then take you to the mainstream. But if you're trying to get to mainstream without starting in these small groups, you're going to have a more difficult time because there are so many people that you are competing with in those mainstream rooms that you don't have the same competition. If you are talented, I'm going to go back to what Rahina said um, with the visa with the O-1 visa, if you are an individual with extraordinary talent, you're going to get ahead. Exactly. And so find those little communities. If you're in the Bronx, go to Hunts Point. They they got wonderful, the Hunts Point um, uh, 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 group. I, I can't think of the, the whole name, but Hunts Point has a fantastic, fantastic uh, center to help people. You you don't even have to go to a prestigious school. You could go to a school that has arts to get your feet wet. Exactly. And then when you've got something going, then go to Juilliard, go to Stella Adler, go to Yale, go then go to a, an established place that when people see your resume, they're going to let you in. I can't tell you how, uh, how important that is and how much it's not what you know, it's who you know. Exactly. And if they, you know, you got to be the best at what you do. But if you say, I study with Stella Adler, that's going to open a door for you. If you 100%. say, I study with Uda Hagen, that's going to open a door for you. Exactly. If you say Juilliard or you say Yale or you say Carl Carnegie Mellon, uh, UCLA, USC, there's certain schools that are like, they just open the door. Come on in. Come on in. It's true. And and you want as an actor, talent is not enough. Mm -hmm. You have to think of what you can use to get you to the front of the line. Exactly. Because there's a lot of competition. They not may not be as good as you, but they might be more savvier than you are when it comes to work or when it comes to networking. My favorite. Uh, quote is from Will Smith. He says, I may not be the most talented, but I'm going to stay till everybody else is gone. Mm. I'm going to be the last man standing. I'm, I'm paraphrasing him a little mm. bit, but it's like, it's, you know, we sometimes as actors, we think it's all about talent. I come back to that again, because it's really crucial. It is. it is about talent. And then it's about the business on right. top of the talent. I think a lot of us started out being like, well, I'm so talented. You know, I deserve to be this or I deserve to be. And when you come into the realization that really talent isn't, isn't it. Because if it's meant for you, it'll happen. But if you don't work towards being better each day, because there's always going to be someone either more talented or, you know, more attractive. Or sometimes in the common misconception that I hear a lot of my clients is that, when they don't get the jobs, they're like, well, I just keep not getting the job. Like I go to auditions, I go to hundreds of auditions. I wake up super early. I'm in line at Pearl Studios at four in the morning for the equity calls and the non-equity calls. And I'm like, yeah, but have you gone to see a show? Have you gone to talk to other people in the industry, people whose career you admire? What is their path? It's not only about going to auditions 100%. It's also about connecting with people because at the end, the, the acting industry, in my experience, is very lonely in a way. That's why I love theater because you get to rehearse something for months or weeks and then you bond and you get to do it over and over again. And film and TV is more like, this is your call time, you're here, you do this and then you leave because time is money. So in my opinion, I think, and this is something that I do with my clients, we find their artistic reason. What's their artistic mission? 
What's everything that they left behind in their country? What's everything they are have sacrificed in order to pursue that dream? And I tell them, as long as you have a 0.5% of that that you know in your soul with your whole body, that there's a 0.5% in you that will deserve and will get the 0-1. And, 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 and I name it 0-1, but it means the career of your dreams, the career that you want to have. If there's at least 0.5% in your soul, in your body that believes it, that's all it counts. Because more likely than not, we keep on this, we keep, we keep swimming in this society of meritocracy. What have you done? Who do you work with? What are you doing? What awards do you have? What project? What comes next? That sometimes it's just so overbearing. And if you stop for a second and look behind you, and see everything that you've gone through, everything that you've put into your effort and your career and your in, in the dream and the life that you want, that stop and looking back is what really fuels you into understanding that you are extraordinary. And if you don't believe you are extraordinary, then no one else is going to believe it. Then the USDA is going to be like, eh, me, no. So in this case, when it comes to applying for the O1 and seeing all the criteria, it's extremely overwhelming because it's like, I'm not Salma Hayek. I don't have awards. I don't have this. I don't have that. Distinguished companies. How? Press? How am I going to talk to the press about me? Who's going to want to write about this little girl from Cancun in New York? There's thousands of them. Okay. So in the session that I have with my clients is, let's find your artistic reason. What makes you extraordinary? What's that 0.5%? What are the things that you have put aside in order to follow this dream? You've left your country. You're, you've left your, your, your language even. You've left your culture. You've left your friends, your family, sometimes even partners, sometimes even children behind to pursue something that a part of you believes that, is, um, that you can acquire, that you can get. So I think it is a brave task to migrate from a place to another in search of a better life. And this is what I offer in the session, to find that artistic reason. I, I want to um, come back to something you said. So people go on auditions, they go on auditions, and they don't get anything. And I would, I would suggest, first of all, don't go on auditions just to go on an audition. Be intentional on the auditions you're going on and make sure you get coached on it. Mm. You know, we could be talented, but when it comes to auditions, we may not see the whole uh, uh, script. We may not be able to see all the parts. And so if, if you are, if you're serious, you're going to have somebody work with you so that they can pull out some pieces that maybe you didn't think about. So when you get in the room, you're going to stand out because everybody did the piece the same way. You're coming in with a different take. Exactly. Your take is going to be the one that they remember. Even if you're not right for it, they're going to go, you know what? I like Regina. She was, she came in shiny. We got to find something for her. And, and that is how it is. If you come in prepared, not just I'm auditioning for this, you know, because that's like being a hamster in the, in the wheel. You just keep going, 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 going. And then you don't understand why nothing has happened. You got to be intentional. What is it that you want? What kind of career do you want? It, it's not about Selma Hayek, uh, Jennifer Lopez. They got the careers they want. They, they are, they are calculating where they want to go to next. This is what I want to do. What is it? What is it? Going back to what you said, your special sauce. What is it that you bring to the table, and how can you exploit that in a way that puts you out there? And with that, you have to utilize social media to your advantage. It's not about scrolling. It's being intentional. Your social media becomes your press agent. So you you put down, oh my God, I just had an audition 
for so-and-so. And I got to meet one of my favorite theater directors, Baba Louie. Mm. And, and it was so exciting because I saw his play, Timbuktu, down at, um, at uh, the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater Company. And I was so impressed. I went and saw it five times. So that. now I'm putting stuff out there that separates me from everybody else. It also lets that director know, because I've tagged him, how much he affected me. Right. So even if he doesn't use me, because we think it's about this job. No, it's about a career. It is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And so you have to lay, your, your, your job is to plant the seeds everywhere you go, plant seeds, water it. And now you're, now you're creating community. Now people are knowing you. And now you are part of an industry that is appreciative of you because they see that you're doing the work. You're not coming in just being glam or just, you know, I want to be rich and famous, but you're actually coming in with value. You're, you're, you're celebrating people. I love what you said earlier about your spirit is one to celebrate, one to be optimistic. And I think in this business, uh, those people are the ones that shine. So we have to shine. Our job is not just to be an artist, but to be a shiny artist. Not not a surfacey, not a surfacey shiny, but shining from inside out so that people want you. You know, the actors who work all the time work all the time because people like them in their environment. Something I I heard Shonda Rhimes say years ago uh, in an uh, in an interview with Oprah. She said, "We vet everybody because I learned that." I, you know, in the beginning, I wanted all the most talented actors, right. but I learned that the most talented actors don't play well with others. Yeah. And so I want a set where everybody plays well together. Right. So I'd rather have an actor who's not the most talented, but they're going to uh, show up and make everybody happy just by their presence. And I think, you know, you, you want to be mindful to be a, an actor of excellence, but also have a spirit on you that everybody gravitates to. Oh, Not because you're so-and-so, but because of your, your person. I have an anecdote that I've been, when we were talking about talent and how sometimes we don't take into full consideration the full picture, right? So uh, when I was auditioning for El Otro Oz, uh, written by Mando Alvarado, and the music was written by... Um, Tommy, ah, I forgot, and Jaime Lozano, um, but sending lots of love everywhere you are, anywhere you are. Um, we, we, it's, it's a Latinx adaptation of The Wizard of Oz, so I was like, of course I want to, I want to, I want to be part of this, and I memorized, but it had been so long since I did musical theater, and so I memorized uh, Buenos Aires from Evita, right? And so, in my opinion, singing is what now is one of my strongest suits. But early, like earlier in age, at the beginning of my career, I was very self-conscious about my voice. And so I go into the audition, and I the pianist is right there, and where you know I give him my my binder, and I'm going for the role of the witch, and I sing, I start singing Buenos Aires. And I forget the lyrics. I just forget them. And I just started. <laughs> and I just kept going instead of really like freezing and just like getting like that. I just, I just kept going. And I was like. <laughs> and the director and the choreographer and the producer were there. And they were just laughing so much. And I made it kind of like. What am I gonna do? This is live, you know. This is live. I'm not just gonna freeze it. I could have said, "Okay, can I start again?" But in that moment, it just didn't feel right, and I just was like, "Okay, I forgot the lyrics." Blah, 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 blah. And then the second time, even the director Elena Arauz, whom I love, and after that audition, she invited me for. I mean, ever since I met her in that audition room, 
she's been bringing me back and back and, and over and over again for the productions that she's been working on. And that's the story. You know, I went into the audition and I fluked it. You know, I was like, it was such a fluke. It was, I, I tried singing and I, I did the dancing. I did the scene after and the singing was just not there. I mean, the voice was there, but the lyrics weren't there. So I left the, that day and I was like, well, at least I'm back in musical theater. I did my best. This is my first audition in musical theater in ages. This is my first in-person audition in a year and a half. Everything is going to be fine. And then I receive a call that I get a call back and I'm like, what? I get the call back and they ended up casting another girl for that role. And then a month later, I emailed them and because they didn't tell me anything. I was just still waiting. And I was waiting because I was in Mexico and I didn't know if I should go back to New York for the auditions or I was managing something in my logistics. But then they were like, unfortunately, we already cast that role. However, the girl who we had casted prior as the mom and as Carnival Gloria, which is Glinda, and as the Wizard of Oz, uh, she's, she's not going to be able to work with us. Do you mind saying the audition in two hours? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. I called my one of my best friends, she's my neighbor, and she has like wigs and stuff. So I was like, okay, hand me this wig because the Wizard of Oz is like a diva. She's based on J-Lo and Shakira. And so I was like wearing wigs and I send it in like two hours, send it the following hour. They're like, you got the job. You're, you're good. You're good. Um, and it just tells about the whole thing as sometimes in our mind, we're like, I'm so talented. I did this and this is incredible. And I know the whole script. And sometimes it's all about the energy that you put out. And, the, and if people want to work with you as a person, if if you have that attitude of learning and, 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 you know, I forgot the lyrics. So what do you do? I didn't freeze, you know, like those anecdotes. That's one of my favorite. Anecdotes. Well, it also shows, it also shows them you're professional, right? Because when you do live theater, things happen, right? Exactly. Things happen that are out of your control, but how will you, you showed them, okay, if something like this were to happen, we're still, the show is still going <laughs> on. So that's, that's a beautiful, no, and that, that's important to, yeah. to know. A casting director I interviewed recently um, said something and it has stayed with me and it is, we don't have to interview, we get to interview. Mm -hmm. We get to do it. Not, oh my God, I have to interview for this, I have to, no, it's the joy yeah. I get to. And with that, um, I, I'm a believer the interview is the job. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, I'm an interview to see if I get the job. No. no, the interview is the job because you may not, going back again, you may not get that that job at that moment. You didn't get the other job, right. but the timing was perfect when you sent the email that they that the other person fell out exactly. and they were like, wait a minute, we can, maybe she would be right for it. You know, that another door open, exactly. another door open. Yeah. So um, with your program, going back to your program, what is it called? The O-1 your, Visa your, uh, Masterclass. Okay, the O-1 Visa Masterclass. And how long is it? It's a two hour session, a one-on-one -on -one session. I do it in two different, um, two different ways. The first one is a one-on-one -on -one session uh, it's a two-hour two, uh, one-on-one session where we talk person to person and I hear their experience, if they have any professional background, uh, what have they done, and then based on what they tell me, uh, we go through the structure of the application. So because, and I do want to emphasize this, I am not a lawyer, I am not giving legal advice. So... Imagine the application is, you know, 100%. And the lawyer, what it does is that they know the legal terms, they know the documents that you will be asked for, they know everything. But when it comes to gathering the information and building your portfolio and reaching out to the people that will help you out, you know, letters of recommendation, 
recommendation, a sponsor, your deal memos, and all that jazz. You have to put it all on paper. So in the prosecution, the lawyer does the 25%, and the applicant, in this case, the international artist, does the other 75%. So it's not even. So you help them with the exactly. pre? Exactly. So what I do is I give them the tools for them to do the 75% of that. So they work hand in hand because it would be uneven if the person that has to do the more most amount of work doesn't know where to start, doesn't know, and the person that knows the most about it does a little bit. I mean, they do a lot, but at, at, the, at the end of the day, this is for the applicant to know that they have the tools and the control because what's at stake, it's their life. It's their career, it's their dreams. So I want the applicant and I want my clients to feel confident, comfortable and informed to bet for the careers that they want and work hand in hand with the lawyers. So this is a step-by-step -step guide of the whole process. I give them contacts for lawyers, for press. I give them templates for different documents that they will be requested and with anecdotes and stories of how I did it and how I created my own stuff of topics um, in my in my resume you know everything that I added to my resume comes from something that I created and collaborated with different companies so based on anecdotes and, and things uh, uh, that I did that worked for me and have worked for other of my clients is is that it's just a two hour session conversation with a presentation that they have unlimited you know unlimited access to the presentation the guides the templates the contacts for lawyers the contacts they also have access to a community of all of my clients and because art is to build a community um, sometimes my clients find out that there's another person in their country that they're also working towards going to the U.S. So they end up uh, partnering and creating stuff together so that they can get, you know, press and help and support and build their own communities in, in towards the same goal. That's fantastic. Uh, so, so what, so you have a two hour session with them. They have, they now have accessibility to all your templates Correct. and do they get a follow-up with yes. you to just walk through what they've done and then say okay here's my stuff can you look it over can you tell me if i'm on the right track oh. before they go to the oh, lawyer course. before they go to the immigration of lawyer course. and 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 they have to go to an immigration right. lawyer so uh the specifically they, i mean sometimes my clients ask me uh, can I do with, can I do the process with a lawyer from back home? Just a regular lawyer. You know, sometimes they have contacts or someone in their family is a lawyer and they're like, I don't want to pay the amount that the U.S. immigration lawyer is, is telling me. So I'd rather go in with this other lawyer that I know fully and completely. And what I say is that as long as they know the immigration process and they know what documents need to be submitted, then choose. And there's also, it's, it's a question because also the lawyers decide who they take on, whose case they take on. Sometimes they say, you know what, you don't have enough evidence, build more portfolio and then come to me. If I tell you the amount of uh, law firms that told me that I didn't have enough evidence, it was about 30. I talked to 30 different lawyers all over the U.S. and I was just starting out my OPT, which is the year that... I had to build my case and they were all like, I mean, we'll submit it for you, but we don't think you'll get it. I mean, if you pay us, we'll work with you. But in that attitude, I was like, excuse me, con permiso, déjame pasar. And I called so many lawyer firms, law firms, and it got to one that I was like, so this is what I have. I'm willing to work this whole year in everything that you tell me. I want to be guided. This is what I have. What can we what can we work with? And they were like, okay, can you get this, this, and that in the next two months? And then after that, can you get this and this? And I was like, yes. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's work together. And that's the, that's the teamwork that you do with the lawyer. You work together evenly with the lawyer. 
So I do have follow-ups with my clients. Uh, I tell them that if they have any questions, if they need me to look into the stuff that they have, um, I'm always available for them because I know how it feels to be in their position because I know exactly the frustration that it is that the lack of information, the lack of support, the abuse and, and the amount of money that is spent in these cases, it's gigantic. So I know the mindset that we go through. What's the average cost uh, to work with an immigration lawyer? Not a lawyer, <clears throat> but an immigration lawyer. So what is the range, the, the financial range? It depends. There are some lawyers that are like really low, low cost in between two to 500, but they are very selective with the people that they take on. And there's others that the range varies in between five to 8,000 uh, for the application. And that's solely with the law firm because there's also other prices that, you know, the application costs and other things that you invest. But the thing is, I call this as an investment. It is an investment. Because at the end of the day, when I submitted for the O one, one I was like, in the next following three years, I want to get back. This is, this is why I'm investing in this visa. Because in the next following three years, I want to earn back and more my investment. Because I know that in the U.S., I will be able to get it back. And thankfully, I have. So that's the thing. So how have you been taking care of yourself financially while you have been in the States? Because I, I, I believe that's also uh, something that they want to know that you could take care yes. of yourself financially, that you're not going to, you know, that's, that's the fear right. of Americans that the immigrants are coming and they're going to take all of our programs. Oh my gosh. They're taking stuff they should not no. have. So no. <laughs> How how have you uh, taken care of yourself financially in order? Because being an actor costs it money is. in the Especially beginning. In it York. costs, you know, you're talking about immigration. Yeah. That's one component. But you got to eat. You got to put shelter. You, you, you have to have shelter. Yeah. You have to be able to take your classes and 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 tra uh, ground transportation. I mean, it's not it's cheap awesome. to to uh, study to be an right. actor. And the way that I've managed to be, I have been extremely thankful for the opportunities that have been presented to me. I've been prepared and, and lucky enough to be at the right time and the right place to be working constantly in different forms of productions. I've done theater for this amount of time nonstop. I finished one project, I started another one. I've been very lucky, but at the beginning, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that at all. So I was a preschool teacher. I was uh, I was babysitting. I was a nanny. You know, I I did find some. I was a translator. Um, it, when I was uh, when I would come home for the the summer, I worked as a pirate in a pirate ship, and everything that I I earned, I saved it to to bring it to New York. Um, I worked as a, an entertainment staff in a hotel, and then in New York, I would do translating. I was a babysitter, nanny. I would do, uh, you know, I was a preschool teacher, and I taught musical theater and gymnastics. So you've been yes, hustling. You've been hustling. You have been making yeah, your Yeah, it's hustling, okay. and it's also learning about saving, because I'm very impulsive. And I'm like, well, I'm in New York. I need to go see theater. I need to do this. I need to pay my rent. But having everything organized, like you were saying, with the agenda, with a planner, that has helped me so much. I'm very organized. So I had to learn how to save money. And even though I didn't like it, because I was like, but I want to do this. I want to do this. My adult version of Regina, my Regina from the future would be like, no, girl, we need to save, we need to save. So I would do, Regina from the past would do favors for Regina from the future. Yeah. I love that. And, and you're talking about seeing theater and stuff and, and, and learning about resources that are available because mm -hmm. they have 
uh, day ticket. Yeah. You know, you could see the play that day for a, a, a lower fee. Certain theaters give you yes. that option. Um, also, uh, connecting with um, mm -hmm. equity, connecting with, uh, um, you know, you could work the theater as a right. usher to That's see the true. show. So, so there are a lot of ways to be able to get your theater fix uh, without having to fork out, right. you know, hundreds of dollars to see a show because they can be very expensive. Oh, yeah. But I love, I love this. I love what you're oh. doing. I am cheering you, you on. I am proud of you. I love that you are so not only insightful, but, but you are so resourceful. Mm. And that's what it takes. Thank you you, you know, you have to be resourceful. If I want to do this, what do I need exactly. to do to get there? You know, and I, I love that. I, I celebrate you. I think that it, 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 it makes me feel so good to know that there are people out there like you that are just kicking oh, butt. Oh my goodness. And, and I, I want to say one thing, um, because I've watched, uh, I watched all your videos. Um, you have a fantastic voice. You have such a lovely voice. So I was like, yeah, that's a, that's Broadway that she's, she is definitely ready oh, for Broadway. So, so I just, I just salute you. And, um, I will, we will, for those of you watching, we will have all of Regina's information below so you can contact her and, and get yourself in order. Yes. <laughs> and I want to say one last thing, people, you know, um, sometimes we miss opportunities because we think something is too expensive. We want to be in the right rooms and that takes money. And sometimes you got to save it so you can get there. You know, you want to, you want to accustom yourself to think of wanting the very best. Sometimes you can get a deal. Sometimes you can't, and you have to do your homework and research and see what the difference, you know, can I get this a little cheaper or is this mm -hmm. it? You know, there's some stores you go into, they don't have bargain prices. Yes. So if you want something from that store, you got to save for it. Now you can, you can be that frugal person that doesn't spend a lot of money, but it also hurts you in the process. Mm -hmm. So you may want to think about doing some mind uh, set work for yourself to start thinking of yourself. If you want to make a lot of money, you, you're going to have to invest something. I'm not saying, you know, go out there and spend money you don't have, but it, you may need to have a season where you are just putting money away so you can study with an mm. excellent teacher. You know, taking acting classes is expensive and, and for me, who has been doing it for a long time, what I've learned is that you don't take one class and then it's over. No, your body is an instrument. So you want to take classes pretty Amen. regularly and they're not cheap. The good ones are not cheap. So what are you doing to uh, fill your coffers so that you can go, you know what? I want to take classes with Larry Moss for the next two weeks because he's he's got a, a limited class. It's, you know, it's thousand dollars. I don't have a thousand dollars. So let me save that thousand dollars. So the next time he comes around, exactly. I'm ready. I'm ready. I got my money. I'm going to study, you know, uh, think in terms of the investment you're making is only going to make oh. you better. And it's only going to add value to you. If you're always doing rinky dink things because of the prices, you never get to be with the A-listers. So you have to be intentional and go, I want to be with the A-listers. And maybe you don't, maybe you want to do rinky dink <laughs> things, but, but you want to know what it is you want. Nobody can tell you, but you have to be intentional. I, I, I want to say that one more time to be intentional. So if you want to be in the States working as an actor, then you've got to start working on your visa and you've got to start putting your stuff together. And Regina is a great Aww. person to help you get your portfolio <laughs> together so that you can then find that lawyer to seal it for you, to make everything happen. And just remember that it takes work to get work. It takes money to get money. It takes a uh, resourcefulness. 
because you can, I love that you came up with a program to help other actors so that that can exactly. also help you. You know, it, it's acting, acting doesn't always pay all the time. So we have, so if we could have other hustles that bring value to other people while helping us get to our next gig, I'm all for it. You know, if you look at, if you look at the queen, yes. Jennifer Lopez, her money was not made uh, from her acting. It was made from her, uh, her products, her, her concerts, her other stuff. You know, so in today's arena, actors have other forms of income coming in so that they can act. It's true. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, we look at people and we go, oh my God, they're rich and famous. No, they're, they, they may be famous. We may know them, but if you look at their bank account, it might be worse <laughs> than yours. So... <laughs> that's why you want to make sure you do other things. So I am, I'm so happy for you. I am, I'm so excited to see oh. you on the stage and doing what you do and making thank people you so happy. Much for the opportunity. So thank you so much no, for, for joining thank us today. Thank you for having the space uh, to empower yeah. Latinos. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. We yes, are artists. Mamita. We are to love each other, support <laughs> each other. Thank you. Have fun. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of Acting Smarter Now. If you enjoyed what you heard, please share your thoughts with me. I want to know what you have to say. And I would love for you to share this episode with somebody that you know that might need the information. If you are an actor, and you want to be part of an acting community online, come and join me. All the information is in the description. It is just for you. Yes, it is. Before we go, I want you to check out this next episode that I did with Mr. Stan Zimmerman, sitcom writer and showrunner extraordinaire. Check it out.